Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things musically Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea Welcome, everybody, to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spill the jams and spill the tea. Today is, today, the, today is the 40th uh, main episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast. Oh, is it really? Holy yeah. shit. Well, uh, happy 40th main series episode. Here's to 40 more. And what Go a better us. way... What a better way than to do a 40th episode than with some fucking quality picks today. We're going to be talking about two newly released records. We are going to be talking about a shoegaze album from Korean band Paranool. Uh, we're going to be talking about To See the Next Part of the Dream. And we are also going to be talking about the new debut record from Genesis Owusu. We are going to be talking about Smiling with No Teeth. And later on the Record Club episode today, we have Tyler's recommended album this week, which is Insides by orbital so go check that out once you're done here but yeah we got some shit for y'all today oh my goodness we do also um want to give a shout out to uh the fact that our mutual friend we've sh- shouted this out before i want to shout it again our mutual friend laura is uh, one week away from releasing a compilation of songs for right. trans youth um, the proceeds, as I said, are going towards um, trans youth, specifically to the um, charity Mermaids. Um, and there's that's a there's a stacked track list on this compilation. You have tracks from artists like Shushu, King Gizzard, and the Lizard Wizard, uh, everything, everything, um, and dozens of other artists. Still more stuff being added, I'm pretty sure. So that is going to drop on uh, Friday, April the second, I believe. Um, so go and pre-order that now. Um, if you are, you know, inclined, so inclined, which you should be, um, and and you will obviously be shout shout that out again next week as well. But mm-hmm. there's that. Uh, and we should uh, say before we get started formally, not only do we have a new B sides discography episode that we just did went up yesterday on the Antlers. We're going to be talking about their new album, Green into Gold, uh, next week. And so, you know, if you want to know some of our thoughts on that particular band, boy, do we have the episode for you. It also features uh, Zach, friend of the podcast. So, you know, yes. good stuff there all around. And this week, August and I released our first episode of our anime podcast. Go check that out if you haven't already, if it interests you. So yes. the Rubber Gum anime podcast. Yes, the Rubber Gum so, anime podcast, yeah. where yes. we talk about one of the best movies ever made and then one of the worst movies ever made. It's great. Love it. Yeah, it, it's it's a. I listened to it the other day. It's lots of fun. It's it's if you enjoy watching this podcast and you enjoy kind of spending time hanging out with us, then you'll enjoy the great banter and energy that Jake and August have. It's very much a banter focused podcast, yep. and I mean that yeah. in the best possible way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so be on that. the lookout for future episodes that will be fun. Yeah, yeah. and so we're actually fucking. What's the word? We're we're fucking we're fucking out content these days we're, we're just producing like an amoeba <laughs> up in this bitch um so we'll kick off our main episode as we always do with uh, a recap of what we've been listening to the last seven days uh jake when you could regain your composure why don't you tell us yeah <laughs> what you've been listening to i'm sorry it's jake. like there's no site i love more than morgan's very quiet laugh of just like he sees something and then it's just like fuck me <laughs> It's, it's my favorite and, thing. Um, <laughs> um, um, amoebas. <laughs> I agree. In this I bitch. thought that was good. I'll put it to you like this. It wasn't that it wasn't good. <laughs> that's That's what I'll say. <laughs> I'm going to take that on face value. I think we all should. I mostly mean it on face value. <laughs> all right. Uh, now that my composure has been regained, um, uh, I have listened to 
a lot of stuff this week, which is kind of a miracle considering I've been listening to what we have for the podcast proper a lot, just because, you know, a lot to dig into there. It's going to be a good discussion. Um, but uh, first up on the list, we have been talking about, I guess this will sort of be a two for one, uh, is that, uh, you know, podcast core band, Brock Hampton, new album in two fucking weeks oh let it go boys out and a single fucking rip so i've been listening to that on repeat just because it's like out oh for god you in sale <laughs> tyler <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what's funnier the fact that you did that the fact that the impression was perfect yeah 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 <laughs> Tyler has an undiscovered <laughs> career in East Coast rap. I'm looking Look at the, in the sky! Southern <laughs> the East Coast of New Daddy Zealand. Daddy Brown, that yeah, is. yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's a good that you dropped the Danny Brown thing because that leaves me flawlessly into. I've been listening to Brockhampton single. Danny Brown features on the Brockhampton single, so I was just like. You know, I should I should go back and listen to a little bit of Danny. It's been a while. He's just one of those artists that's like you kind of gotta be in the right mood slash level of intoxication to enjoy. Uh, and I listened to both Triple X and Atrocity Exhibition. Triple um, X is dope. Great tape. Great songs. It's a bit too fucking long, and I've always had that problem with it. But it's still great. Bangers front to back. Um, then I listened to Atrocity Exhibition, which fucking hard. I, I never mm-hmm. like, I, I don't I, like, I always thought it was a great album, but I didn't really hop on to like, this is a masterpiece until my list of the other night where I was just like, God, this is just one of the most consistently inventive hip hop albums I've ever heard. <laughs> it just whips. Uh, so uh, that's lovely. Always good stuff. I, um, uh, after- I, I'm just going to go ahead and, and do this because we've, we've briefly talked about it. I'm adding Danny Brown to the B-Sides list because there's awesome. just so much to talk about with everything he put out. And, and Totally. We need yeah. to do more hip-hop ones anyway, too. Yeah, so that's and, I, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not like officially confirmed, mm-hmm. but I'm pretty sure that we're getting uh, quadruple X this year. Yeah, Maybe. that's right. So, uh, yeah. Say- cool. Um, I, I I figured out that his la- his real last name is Sewell, which isn't is like that fucking weird. <laughs> like, okay, not a good rap name, Danny Sewell. <laughs> uh, what made you think Danny Brown is better? This music makes you shit your pants. Why is it that rappers, especially the ones who are like seen as these eccentrics, have Marshall Mathers? Danny Sewell. <laughs> like, just fucking normal ass names. It's oh. like how David Bowie's real name is David Jones. Yeah, that's <laughs> yes. right. Yes, fucking he, exactly. He was, he was born around here, actually, where I live. My local shopping center is a mural of him because he was born. He was there. born in the local shopping center? <laughs> wow. Yes. Wow. Yes. He fell right <laughs> out. <laughs> Explains so much. <laughs> Okay, um, um oh, <laughs> welcome anyway. to the Jams and Juice podcast. <laughs> just re- just fucking place. redact all of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. The place that you live is like three miles total, so like everybody's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, we're doing a podcast, right? I think. Pretty sure, oh, like, man. the UK's, I, I can't remember whether it's slightly bigger or slightly smaller, but it's about the same size as New Zealand. And I, I think it's a bit right. smaller. Yeah. And, and, like, yeah. Well, just, I, just... I was referencing England itself, but yeah. <laughs> no, I, yeah. England's just a glorified city. Yeah. Are you, <laughs> are you doing, <laughs> yes. you motherfucker? <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Son of a I, bitch. Sorry. Hang on. August, oh, August oh, is... No. <laughs> I was going to say, August is sitting there like, why the fuck didn't I make that stupid joke? Oh, oh no. no. What are you... Hang on. So Morgan bad. hasn't got it yet. <laughs> no. Oh, England man. is my city. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's probably for the best that it's a, it's a, it's, it's a feature on Jake oh, Paul's God. song. Uh, Guest that, rapper says England is my city. <laughs> it's every it's every day, bro, with that Disney Channel flow. <laughs> I get, I, my head hurts. Morgan's just managed to live his life without encountering that. <laughs> it was so easy. <laughs> I saw Jake Paul released a song, and I said no. <laughs> It was so <laughs> Not even oh. as a joke. Get out of here. <laughs> it's going to be a good episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Everything hurts so much. My arm after the shot is so sore. I gotta. Ah, I feel like John McCain over here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, it's Nick Crompton, and my collar stay popping. Yes, I can rap, and no, I'm not from Compton. You know, you know when your homie is just like on the edge, and you just lean on him that <laughs> bit more. That's where I saw Jake was on the edge, and I said John McCain. <laughs> oh god i haven't laughed in a week so jake what have you been listening to this week (laughs) um the second thing i'll mention i listened to uh uh, the soundtrack uh, in the spirit of, of August and I's anime podcast, I listened to uh, the soundtrack uh, to a show called FLCL by The Ooh. Pillows, which, yes, yes. look, I, I, August's comments about the soundtrack on that episode are hyperbolic, but they are hyperbolic with good reason because it fucking rips. Oh, God, it's so fucking good. Just, like... I don't know that that's that's just one of those albums that are I mean like album soundtrack whatever it's just like it's like this is what coming of age sounds like and it's all yeah kind of garagey and like upbeat and fun it's just very fun very fun um yeah well, highly Japanese recommend these bands are always named shit like the pillows the seat belts boredoms yeah. that's a literal Japanese noise rock band name boredoms Rad French, wimps. like Boris. <laughs> their rally. This is. <laughs> um, fuck. Listen, uh, des feux. I listened. Saint des feux. It's cloudy with the chance of meatballs reference for you. Thank you for letting me. That, that's me. that's my I, uh, yes. England is my city, and that I just did not get it. <laughs> yeah, it's fucking uncultured. It yeah, it was more niche than Jacob Paul, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, this morning, I had to leave and drive my mom to get the vaccine, so I put on some albums that uh, I had just been meaning to get to for a very long time and didn't. Uh, first of which being my first album from the band Liars. Uh, big Tyler and Zach energy here. Yes. Uh, drums not dead. Uh, as someone who did not know what a liar song sounded like at all just going into this it's just kind of like oh this is unusual and it's so it's such a strange album it's so like mystic and otherworldly and like ominous and and creepy it's it's like a it sounds like it's a coming from a cult it's so weird and, and offbeat and it's got this like it's just got an immaculate atmosphere about it and it's so menacing and strange and i just can't wait to listen to more of it just because it's so fucking dense it's 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 all of those things completely and then you get to the last track on the album where it's like none of those things it's beautiful and it's um gorgeous and it's uh sparse and it's haunting um god and you know what you said I, you had no idea what a liar's song sounded like before you listened to that. Mm. Congratulations, you still don't. All of their albums, a feeling. All of their albums sound completely unlike each other. 
that that that's refreshing to hear just because this is a band that like even from just one album i'm just like these guys have a lot of versatility because there's just so much dynamic sound exploration on that like tracks are so weird and unwieldy and progressive it's it's so strange like how would you even label them genre wise like um, like post rock no and... uh, I, would, I would well they started off as a dance punk band like um and and i'd say drums not dead is kind of like I, the word that comes to mind is, is kind of something you've sort of already said, but like tribal ritual yeah. sort of stuff. Um, yeah. But it's it's probably closer to like avant-garde. Um, I don't even fucking know. It's not really noise music. It's it's just strange. You're right. Um, cool. I've got two fun liars facts for you. Uh, the first one is that uh, the liars front man, Angus Andrew, they're an Australian band, incidentally, um angus andrew is uh is the subject of the year 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 oh, song yeah, maps oh um because karen o and angus andrew dated uh at the time that their first year years album was recorded and maps uh is literally an acronym for my angus please stay i don't think oh. i would want to be the subject of that song no um, I don't. No. Mm. And my and my second fun liars fact for you is that the final song on drums not dead, that beautiful kind of um, song that's like um, you know like a big warm hug, is yeah. uh, memorably featured in one of the final scenes of the Joseph Gordon Levitt movie Fifty Fifty. <laughs> wow! Which um, what a for, strange choice for a band like that to have like an appearance in such a mainstream film. Uh, is, is so surreal to me anyway that's just but uh, no that's fucking cool <laughs> um fucking oh uh at the recommendation of again tyler and zach uh i listened to the voids compilation of uh from have a nice life uh which features several different takes of songs that are mostly off of death consciousness but also songs that would later be put on uh the last two albums I think defenestration song and like uh uh there's another song on sea of worry and i can't remember what the title is but that's on there too uh and it's great um i i would say it's as good as anything the band have made really i mean the only problem it has is that it doesn't seamlessly flow together like death consciousness does in my opinion but even still it's just great to get these alternate takes and a few extra songs like some of the uh songs that are exclusive to that compilation are some of the best material that the band like ever put out ever it's it's fucking great i think it's like one of the songs is called like trespass which is like top three fucking uh have a nice life songs just fucking that's, rips. uh that's also uh on re-recorded on their album sea of worry that song Oh, it is. Oh, shit. Fuck. I need uh, to listen to Sea of Worry again. And so is um, the closing track on Void's Destinos is also... Yes, Destinos. Yeah. That's the fucking... That was what I was trying but, to think But I actually later. prefer both versions of those songs on the Void's compilation, personally. I think they're, mm -hmm. they're just more full. They sound more full there. They're a bit more stripped back on Sea of Worry. Uh, and there's another that track... That might be because I didn't realize it. There's another one of my favorite songs on Void's uh, Defenestration song is on their... re-recorded on their second album, Unnatural World, as well. Yes, that's um, it. But, but yeah, that uh whole compilation is just baller it's it's mm -hmm. it might be it might be my favorite have a nice life release it's close but if you're a fan of anything the band has ever made in any capacity it's an essential listen if as far as you ask me uh but yeah it's it's pretty fucking great uh i guess last i will talk about um and why not i gave a re-listen to uh, Soundgarden's Super Unknown, uh, which I, I've always kind of uh, drifted a little bit more towards Bad Motor Finger. Um, that is to say that both albums are like basically exactly as good as each other. Um, but re-listening to that is, is a trip uh, just because I forget how like, I don't know. It, it's so funny to me that like the popular song from that album is fucking Black Hole Sun, which is like, you listen to that song and it's just like, this is fucked. And then every other song in the album is like that, but like more. So I don't know how that happened, but uh, 4th of July. Funny. Oh God. It's funny because it, 
it it was as big as it was because of the video and mm-hmm. when you see the video it's like okay that still doesn't explain this they just <laughs> no. play it over and over again yeah, yeah. It, it, it's and just it's like, a great the, fucking song every time it's i put the weirdest stuff i've ever seen in every my time life. I, every time i put super unknown on i it gets like closer and closer to being just one of the best albums i've ever heard like it's yeah, already, it is I, it, like it is kind of that but like it gets higher and higher up the list every time i listen to it like it's just yes. fucking flawless um i am in awe of it it, it, it sounds yeah. completely unlike i mean it, it has some of the sonic signifiers of grunge but also it just sounds completely unlike any other grunge album in its own way that's why i think i've always drifted towards them as like my favorite sort of grunge era like the at least you know like out of the big four because their origins were before the grunge movement started is that they were making fucking doom metal on shit like louder than love and then they go into the 90s with uh grunge in full force that they just combined their sounds and as a result it's like timeless and it's 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 just so good and also let me drown is like top 10 album openers fucking ever yeah because fuck dude yeah fuck completely so good c- completely agree uh it's just One, it's an absurd song i say that super unknown is the best album of 1994 and that Ooh. is a feat it's Look true at the list of albums that I mean, came out that year. there are other years in that decade that don't have an album as good as super unknown <laughs> yeah yeah oh, uh-huh shit. I just looked look up at what this. albums came out in 1994, and wow, yeah, okay. I know we're gonna. Um, if you guys still want to do that whole like, um, when when it gets to the 20 yeah. year anniversary of like that period of grunge history and 30 year anniversary of that that period of grunge history <laughs> in 1991, I know we're probably talking about Bad Motorfinger then, but it would be awesome to have an excuse to talk about their other records at some point yeah, as well. Obviously, very. Wow, well, I wonder that. where if we have a segment. Or a show that we could fit that into. Yeah, I, oh. I sure do wonder. No, yeah, that would be nice. Anyway, I figure it's my turn to talk about what I, what records outside of the podcast I have listened to this week, and I will do so starting now. First, a uh, legendary industrial metal album, Psalm 69, The Way to Succeed or The Way to Suck Eggs by Ministry. Um, oh, nice. This being an album that completely redefined just how heavy industrial metal could be in the 90s. And it's, uh, it's insane. It's just absolutely the most cocaine fueled shit you've ever heard. Like, and it's this really anti, like anti Bush senior album. So, uh, if that's your jam, super political industrial metal with lots of samples and looped guitars, uh, check it out. Been meaning um, to get into, been meaning to get into that band ever since. I think it was. Oliver from Deep Cuts, who recommended um, The Land of Rape and Honey as one of his favorite yeah. albums, uh, which is a hell of an album title. But I, yeah. need, to, uh-huh. I need to check out the records really badly. Yeah, uh, don't right. start with the first one. Or as I mm-hmm. call them, mid mystery. Uh, uh, their yeah. track record is kind of god awful. Their most yeah. recent album was a uh, no, real, uh... real bad. No, bad, last two and, albums and were like, real, real bad. And, and looking at, at rate your music here, it looks like the last like uh, like ten have been a little rough. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, Still can't sink lower than naming your album America KKK can't. Well, all I all I will say is that when you look at a band's discography, um, before you kind of look at the track record, it's also helpful to just look at the members and who was yeah. in the band during what time as well because usually i don't know if this is true of ministry but usually when you have bands that have like a, a really high period and then a really low period you can usually attribute that to um changes in membership iron maiden well, wink wink alice yeah, in it, it is. yeah there's like a shitload of various people who yeah. this band, but 
Al Al Jorgensen has been the the front man and the the dude, the mind behind it for all of it. All of so. it, yeah. Good to know. So he's to blame. <laughs> uh, next thing, I listened to MGMT's debut album, Oracular Spectacular. This was the only MGMT album I had not heard, and it's it's good. Uh, yes. First half is definitely way, way superior to the second half, which yeah. almost feels into like it's entirely filler with like one exception of one song that's pretty good that I can't remember the name of, but whatever. Uh, but yeah, that first half, really solid, a lot of great memorable singles, I think. I mean, they obviously went on to do stuff like A Little Dark Age and Congratulations, which are two albums I absolutely adore and think are uh, fantastic. And this is a really uh, good starting point, and I think it really gives you a sense of their, their evolution in context with everything else. So it's, it's cool. And now uh, the... Frank Zappa segment where I talk about all the Frank Zappa albums I listened Frank Zappa to. Our... Particularly under the Mothers of Invention name. Uh, first, Absolutely Free. This was the immediate follow-up to his to Mothers of Invention's iconic uh, debut record, Freak Out. This is comes immediately after that. It's tr- going for a lot of the same things, just significantly not as good and not as like sharp and relatively cutting edge but it's still an enjoyable album there's some really good highlights on here uh but it does not quite reach the same highs as something like freak out or we're only in it for the money uh next uh mothers of inventions album cruising with Ruben and the Jets. This is a doo-wop album that is a throwback to 1950s stuff. And this kind of sucks. Uh, <laughs> it's not very good at all. Like, it's just a bunch of really cheesily written doo-wop songs. And even if the intention was to like, parody the genre which it's clearly not it's clearly intended as like a send up to the genre like this this is what all of what was cool about it it's just so sappy and dumb it makes me want to barf but finishing this off with uh the best record i listened to this week also shockingly the mothers of inventions uncle meat this is a rambunctious 75 minute long album that is a collage of live tracks jazz uh doo-wop tracks which is a combat which was meant as this soundtrack to a film they never ended up making with the same title called uncle meat and there's just it's just absolutely full of the most mind-meltingly awesome jazz possible. Like the D side is just all renditions of this song, King Kong. And it's just fucking amazing. It's like each different rendition, like a different instrument is leading the song essentially. And it's just going wild. I, I, I'm, I'm looking at this now and I love some of these subtitles for these King Kong tracks. I'm going to read some of them. There's no, uh, please. King Kong itself as played by the mothers of, in, in a studio, which is the only 53 seconds long. Yeah, it's, it's short, kind of gives you the general motif. There's uh, King Kong, it's magnificence as interpreted by Dom DeWilde. There's King Kong as Motorhead explains it. There's um, language, King Kong, the Gardner varieties, which I presume is a, a reference to Bunk Gardner. Um, King Kong, as played by three deranged good humor trucks, which, which That's is the only, new title of this podcast, which is only 29 seconds long. And, yeah. and my favorite title here King Kong, live on a flatbed diesel in the middle of a racetrack at a Miami festival, the Underwood ramifications. And that's also like the that best is, one. That is the eighth circle of hell. 
and this <laughs> album is uh right. 75 minutes long yeah no and and there's also a hilarious like doo-wop song on there called the air which is literally just about bullies beating the shit out of you and you crashing your car <laughs> and it's the funniest fucking thing ever man i really gotta get into this fucking mr zappa Something that made me laugh this week is that our mutual friend Laura listened to a Frank Zappa album. And it's Oh was, yeah, Sheik it Your Booty. Sheik Your Booty, which has him uh, on the cover in like an Arabian garb, um, doing this really serious face. Yeah. Uh, and and the and the first song on the album is called I Have Been In You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there is also a 12-minute song on there called Yo Mama. That 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 has early wean energy, and, like and that's. Also he's, and he's also he got a song earlier nothing. in his career called "My Guitar Wants to Kill Your Mama." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, that, Morgan, what have you been listening? To? He's got one called "Chunga's Revenge." <laughs> that one's great. It's I talked about that. Awesome. Big Chunga's Revenge. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> someone get a frank zappa album cover and just put big chungus on it please give it to me uh, okay <laughs> so uh i what i listened to this week okay uh well what i'll say first is i i towards the end of this segment for me last week i trailed off like an idiot because I forgot what I, I had listened to. Um, and now I remembered. I re- actually remembered like the day after we recorded. And I've been thinking that I must remember it for the podcast this time for the whole week now. Uh, but anyway, another 1991 banger. I listened to Massive Attack's Blue Lines for the first time. Oh, and yes. like, yeah, yep, yeah, fuck it, fucking, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah it's good unfinished sympathy that that's the tweet mr attack yes um also uh sort of picked up my uh long drawn out almost a year now that i've been working on this of listening to all of the manic street preachers albums um and just 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 god boy is it a slog at this point um i i'm questioning my decision Um, it looks like they have a run of just really incredibly unremarkable albums after a certain point yeah it's yeah and that's the run that i'm on uh Mm. the first one that i listened to was uh lifeblood which um if uh, uh, sure um the one i yep. listened to after that was send away the tigers which had some great songs on it some of the uh supposed to be like their sort of return to form album and it does sort of have it has some great songs on it where it's like this is this is a bit like everything must go meets generation terrorists it's like i see where it it gets at here but it's it's also just good it is merely passable so you know not exactly a lot of motivation to get through all of these things i'm really only doing this just so i have full context for a journal for plague lovers so and that is the next one up so that's something uh, another thing listen to was a uh, ep called irony is a dead scene Oh uh, yes. Dylan's escape plan Ooh. with Mike Patton. Oh, and what I, now? I, yeah, I, and I gave it a nine, and not a ten, purely because it's only four songs, and they ch- I feel cheated out of an album. Uh, what is it called again? God. Irony is a dead scene. Yeah, that's um, I don't know. It's like it's it, 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 it's like just if you, if you've heard calculating infinity. Just imagine it's a bit like that, but if 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 Mike fucking Patton 
Mr. Bungle himself, if that is his real name, was on it. It's a, I mean, like, I, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's perfect. Um, something that's for the podcast, but won't be uh, until a few weeks from now. I listened to Agalock's Pale Folklore. Ah, um, yes. Yeah, that'll do. I'll have yes. five more. It's uh, it's amazing how good they start off, and then they're just like, okay, okay, okay. But what if we did it again, but better? And then they did it again. Yeah, I, I haven't listened to The Mantle enough to feel confident in even bringing it up on here. But it was, yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and last I'll bring up is also inspired by the new Brockhampton single. I listened to Danny Brown's Triple X and the shit just, just knocks. It just, I knocked my headphones off. <laughs> it goes. <laughs> my first, knock. Yeah. If my first exposure to, to Danny Brown, um, and I will be coming back for more. It, it's um, good that that was your first one because if you were like me and just went straight into atrocity exhibition, you'd just kind of be like, "Yeah, it's okay. kind of like going into the deep end." I, yeah, I, I, it, it is. Starting, I'm actually really starting cu- Autecker with Confield. <laughs> you know, I'm actually really curious, Morgan, to see how you respond to old because that's a really divisive yeah. album, um, and I can is see it really it is quite divisive. Um, I just thought it was kind of underrated, but I guess that lets the my opinion loose for it. But well, I mean, it is underrated. I agree with you, um, yeah. but it, it's. Um, um, cause it's like full on trap pop bangers in the back half of it. Um, but Danny just like, it's so unhinged and so over the top trap that it's almost like a parody of trap music. Mm. And, but it, it works because Danny's not trying to do any kind of anything satirical. He's just trying to sing about fucking. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's just like, that's, I feel like sometimes when I was listening to Triple X, I'm like, is this like a, 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 a supposed to be a parody or something? But no, he's just that funny. Like, <laughs> basically just a comedy rap album with this dude going ape shit over it. I think you'll really like You Know What I'm Saying as well. That's just like a, it, it's an accessible project, but it's also like his most mature. It, it's just him being like, and I won't say that it's like not unhinged. It's definitely got its moments, but it's also like, I'd say that it actually has the same appeal as like a Run the Jewels album because mm. like they they feature on one song, uh, but still it's it's that kind of vein. I think I believe Danny uh, said that it was his uh, like attempt to do like the musical version of like a stand up comedy album. Like, yeah, like, yeah. And I read that Q Tip was a producer. Yes. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Hi. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's all for me. Okay. Um, I actually haven't listened to very much this week. Um, I'm now going to get into three albums that were released this year that I wanted to catch up on that were bad. Um, oh. The, uh, so I'm going to start with the new Lon Del Rey record. That's all I have to say about it. Is. <laughs> it, it. It's there. Or is it? It's up to you. Um, I don't think it is. You stole my bit. I was going to say the new <laughs> Lana Del Rey record. Or is it? <laughs> It just, uh, but yeah. um, I also listened to the new album by British metal band Architects, um, and they're listed on Radio Music as primarily metalcore, which is, this album is not. W- what it is 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 boring. Um, mm, my favorite genre. <laughs> <laughs> about two thirds of the way in, there's a ten second feature from Simon Neal of Biffy Clyro. Um, no, no. From, from that point through to the end, it, it, it was like possible. Like I could hear that there were songs happening, but for the rest of it, the production's super murky and condensed, and the vocal delivery is risible. Like I, I, I it's like a parody of metalcore vocal delivery, and mm. not not fun. This um, is entirely unrelated. But did you all know that there is a new AJR album out this year? No, no. Oh yeah, I no! I wish, and I wish that I didn't know. It's but already you know, out, so like we're fine. Yeah. Oh, thank God! <laughs> but you know what um, did come out this year that I listened to of my own free will and choice? Oh no! Justice. 
Oh no! Justice. I the the, 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 the new intro? Justin Bieber record. Um, I would say that no. there's mm-hmm. nothing that is as aesthetically ill-conceived as, as Yummy, but there's a lot that's as like intellectually Ill- ill-conceived. I read like, some. Sorry, continue. the Martin Luther King. Yeah, oh. well, it's not just he samples Martin Luther King twice. Um, but the thing that gets you is the second time. The first one's right at the beginning, and the second time's about halfway through, and it's a quote about having something to die for. And I hate to say this, but Anthony Fantano put it best because I listened to the review immediately after listening to the album, where he said the thing that Justin Bieber wants to die for is pussy, and that's the song. Pussy and religion, as Kanye says on in My Beautiful Dark Twisted of Fantasy. That, that's what justice is about. I've read some reviews yeah, as yeah. well. I read a really great review from Stereo Gum, which was not was more mixed than negative. Certainly mm-hmm. said that it was a big step up from the last Justin Bieber album, but that it, it kind of would lead itself down with his worst kind of uh, production tendencies. Like apparently it's yeah. more kind of a rock oriented record. Uh. I definitely felt like, like it, there's just more guitars rock. on it. And more, he realized that people thought his last album, well, he tried to make an R&B record with his last one and people didn't get that that's what he was doing. So he was like, all right, so I'm going to really make it undeniable with this one. Yeah, he's like um, pivoting away from R&B, which is maybe for the best for him. You see, I actually got huge R&B vibes off of this record more than okay. more than rock. There's hardly any rock in here for me. Well, like I mean, I, I mean, rock in the same way that like Imagine Dragons are rock. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, there's a better argument for that for sure. Um, like, like the, the purely synthetic sound that's meant yeah. to evoke that kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah. Just, um, just not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's bad. So why should I talk any more about it? Let's see what Tyler has listened to. I actually haven't listened to a, a whole heap of new music in the past seven days that we are not talking about. Um, with one incredibly significant exception that I'll get to in a minute. One thing I do want to touch on, though, is that I've been revisiting uh, the catalogue of a band that I have loved since I was a teenager, been super influential on um, my musical development, and that is the indie rock slash math rock band, The Dismemberment Plan. Um, and mm. uh, I have, they have... A series of excellent albums from the mid 90s to 2001 uh, and they are this really cool uh, as I said indie rock band but they have um, they write these sort of indie rock songs but they are do they perform them in this very kind of off-kilter style um, their classic album Emergency and I which is um, a massive record from 1999 um, definitely my favorite album of that year um, great record uh, is like has every single song is in like odd time signatures and it's like really off kilter and strange and fast paced. Um, and, and it's always been sort of a record that's been really close to my heart, it really kind of hit me when I was a lot younger. Um, and so I re- revisited that, but I also revisited the great records they released either side of it. Uh, the Dismemberment Plan is Terrified, which is a really underrated album, um, much in the same vein as Emergency and I, and Change, their 2001 record, which is much less frantic than those two records, uh, but almost more musically accomplished than either as well. Um, just a really, um, really creative, awesome band, um, very unique. There's no other band that sounds like them. And um, Gyroscope is one of the best songs of that 90s. So, um, yes. Yeah, and I, I also told August about, I recommended this band to August this week as well. Um, yeah, so I can see real August really too. digging Emergency and I. I listened to that one twice and it was good. Yeah. So, yeah, I wanted to shout that band out. Um, but the one, um, I also spent the week re listening to the discography of Have a Nice Life and associated pro- projects. Uh, uh, it was not a great week for me personally so that music was a, a huge comfort to me uh particularly um i already i would have already i'm sure i would have shouted this out in december back when it came out yeah even, even though we didn't review it but though i've been especially listening to the last black wing album um which is dan barrett's solo project uh which came out in december of last year called no moon and that's just slowly becoming one of my favorite albums ever um it's just ridiculously listenable from front to back if you enjoy that aesthetic of have a nice life and 
and this and the sort of stuff that Dan does. It's just gut wrenching, emotional, but cathartic as well. And it and unlike any other Dan Barrett or Have a Nice Life project, it actually has an optimistic ending that feels earned and gives me hope. So that's awesome. Um, but pop bangers on the next Have a Nice Life record. <laughs> yeah, it, it it seems to be that could be a possibility. Um, but the big the biggest thing I listened to this week, and it is a very significant first listen to me, is um, I listened to Gore Gut's album Obscura, um, their most beloved and most widely known record. And I haven't had a first listen to an album as incredible as this since Sing to God was the last one. And I can't remember before that how long it's been, um, but it's basically on that level for me. Uh, it's my new favorite metal album. Uh, it is, uh, and and it almost feels blasphemous to say that because it's kind of like, um, what the way I described it in my music board review and on Twitter is I called it the Confield of metal, and that's not just yeah. me. That's not just me saying like it's this. I I love it on the same level as Confield, even though I do. It's that this is a record that does for metal what Confield does for IDM and electronic music. And that it completely upends every expectation, every um, convention, and every thing you would come to expect from well, death metal specifically, um, but just metal in general. Uh, it is uh, relentlessly uh, arrhythmic. Well, it's not arrhythmic. It's just really the rhythms are really odd. Um, it's atonal. It's 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 bizarre. It's uh, uncompromising. It's just astoundingly unfriendly um more so than maybe any other record i've heard in a long time how but also at the same time it's, it's this level of unfriendly but it also just goes it just it just goes in the same way even though there's almost nothing to cling on to there occasionally there'll be a riff that's really awesome and they'll write it but it will be completely uh dissonant and atonal and they'll write it for a few bars and then they'll move on to something else um, but it's just such a technical marvel. Uh, it, it, every aspect of this record is the drumming, the bass, the guitars, the vocals are as good as they could possibly be. Uh, I want to shout out in particular the vocals um, of Luke LeMay on this record, which um, make Chuck Schuldiner on the last two Death records look like Disney Channel. Uh, they are that dark and oppressive. They do just simply don't sound human. Um, they, they, they don't sound like anything I've ever heard. They're fucking bone chilling. Uh, not even, I, not even the first two Gore Guts records really set me up for what Obscura is. And I know I'm being super hyperbolic and, and it won't be the last time I do that today. And I know that it can be one of my most, uh, that one of the, a tendency that I fall on a lot, but if there's an album that earns and deserves the hyperbole, it's Obscura. It's, it's really, truly uh, groundbreaking in a way that very few albums truly are and I mean groundbreaking in the sense that it's really you can't spot any of the things that lead to it you can see some influences and death is certainly one of them but it just feels completely unlike anything else that I've ever heard and maybe that's a reflection of um, the fact that I don't have a huge knowledge of death metal um, but I looked into the reputation this record has and the reviews and stuff and most of that seems to reflect how I experienced it. Um, it's brutal. It's 60 minutes long. So it's a, it's pretty long for a death metal record. Um, but I, I think it earns that runtime. It's grueling. It's genuinely difficult to listen to. Um, and I, and I don't do this to kind of make it sound like this alien thing, but it, it's just the way that it is designed. Um, and yeah, it's, it's my favorite fucking, um, metal album it's it's not as listenable as the other top tier metal records like um symbolic by death or ashes against the grain by agalock that are in my kind of top s tier of the genre um but it's by far the most um technically impressive and just general generally uh dna altering um so yeah that's the only record i really want to talk about in this segment fuck you for liking things I know, right? Yeah. 
Well, God damn that's you. not going to improve as we go on today, I fear. No, probably not. <laughs> so, our, our first review for today... One, two, three, four! I fix the mask and play. Genesis Owusu is a Canberra-based um, musician and rapper who has kind of exploded onto the scene in a really kind of fast and, and unprecedented way, kind of come out of nowhere, um, but has been kind of slowly working behind the scenes to put together and polish this debut record so that it landed, so that it lands with maximum impact. And actually, it's, what's quite interesting is reading about the creative process of how this record is made, is that all of these tracks evolved out of jam sessions with um, musicians um, that uh, oh, Mr. Owusu, actually, I've got his full name written down. Um, Kofi that, Owusu Ansa. That's right. So, I'm, looking, I'm looking at the rim page. So, um, yeah. Genesis Owusu is um, Kofi Owusu Ana, um, and I have to say that um, I find this to be one of the most gripping and promising and stunning uh, debut albums um, that I've heard in a long time. Um, and certainly that we've reviewed on the podcast as it's happened. Um, uh, I have plenty to say on this record, but I want to uh, ask if anyone really wants to particular, particularly wants to lead off. I'll be pretty general. Um... The thing is uh, with this album is that I think that like there's always that there there'll be an album that'll pop up once every year, once every two years. That's specifically in this very distinct avenue of sound. Uh, things like uh, last year we had Miles by Blue and Exile. A couple years before that we had something like. Um, uh, big crits uh album i think in 2017 that i'm forgetting the name of and stuff like kendrick lamar's to pimp a butterfly where it's just sort of this insanely big coalescence of throwback sounds that's also like pushing the boundaries of the genres that it's tackling in a more contemporary sense too uh and i think this is sits right up there with records like that i don't think that maybe uh, it's as unified, as conceptual, or as um, just basically like as dense as some of those records might be, like Forever is a Mighty Long Time or, or T-Pab, but again, that's really not what the album is aiming to do. The, the best way to describe this album, I think, is that it's Genesis coming right out of the gate and showing everyone everything he can do on this first album and just be like this is my avenue this is the this is the kind of music that i'm gonna make and holy shit is he really fucking good at all of it um if the album has any legitimate problems it's really that i just find it to be kind of all over the place sound wise and that's not even really like that's a, that's a feature not a bug necessarily is that this is an album that is constantly shifting styles and influences and many different structural approaches to these this kinds of music that i just haven't heard in a while there's something like you know the beginning of on the move which I mean, the only thing I can compare this to is fucking Death Grips, is that he just sounds like MC Ride coming onto the track with Black Dog Shot the Move! And hooks, hooks everywhere, hooks all over this record. Uh, I don't need you. I don't need you. Fucking, it's so fun it's a blast even in the moments where he gets a little bit more introspective a little bit more serious on songs that are like way more blatantly about race or depression songs like i don't see color or like whip cracker or stuff like that like like whip cracker that song just fucking goes that's like the first part of it is like a really good lead in and then like midway through it has this sort of tempo shift upward where it just rips into it and it's so fucking great and it also has songs like um the admittedly acquired taste of uh, a song about fishing near the end of the album which is just 
It's so delightful. It sounds beautiful. I love it. And I know it kind of comes out of nowhere, but there are actually a lot of lyrical allusions to some of the ideas that he gets at on this album. And I think that's part of the fun of this is that it's like, you're so caught up in the sound and how amazing everything is produced and how amazing everything sounds that you're, you kind of get taken off guard. This is an album that does attempt and mostly succeed at being conceptual. He has lots of narrative references to this idea of the black dog, which is sort of this thing that represents like the negativity in his life things like depression, anxiety, race relations, and it's sort of embodied really, really well continuously throughout the songs. Uh, sometimes he will voice from the perspective of the black dog. And it's, it's always made really apparent when he's doing this. It's never like something that I had to like really, really look into in order, like it's always intuitive. And uh, then it just, it has moments too, where it's like, it's doing all these genres like funk, uh, neo soul and, and like dance and hip hop and like all these different things, but then it just does them in so such a unique way. Uh, most what notably comes to mind is Drown, which features Kieran J. Callanan, and it's so like the guitars on here just so like bright and expansive and. A, a weird thing that I only noticed today when I did my last listen to of it is there's lots of guitars on this that are sort of sampled in some of the beats. And a lot of them sound exactly like guitars that come in at the end of the Mars Volta song Inertiatic ESP. I, I hmm. don't, I know that sounds weird. Go listen to that song, listen to this album. It sounds like they're very distinct distorted guitar tones that are used all over this album, uh, which I mean, I love it naturally. Um, and I, I, there's lots of points that are just super poignant, uh, poignant as well. I think the um, penultimate track, No Looking Back, kind of epitomizes this. It's a very earnest, very sort of uh, uh, encapsulation of lots of the ideas that he's talking about with um, uh, that sort of like black dog thing. And uh, then there's also uh, Don't Need You, which is sort of a song about, you know, moving on from a relationship and sort of, he really does get the idea of the, uh, the sort of happy euphoria you get of just being like, I didn't need this fucking person in my life. I'm, I'm better off without him, fuck it. And then you just sort of go forward. And uh, then there's also songs like Gold Chains where he talks about like trying to sort of revel in materialism and try to use that as a sort of uh, shield for a lot of the things, but he's also like aware of that. He's like talking about how cold it is inside these chains. It's a really slick metaphor. And like, I don't know, man, this record just, it does fucking, it, it just runs the gambit of this entire section of music, this whole fucking world right now. And it does it in an emotional way, in a fun way, in a diverse way. And it's so impressive that it's this big, interesting, fun thing right out of the gate for him. He only had like an EP before this. And it's just like, dude, I want you to take over the fucking world. Because if half of the artists who've made uh, albums past their debut were as good as this, then the world of music as we know it is saved. But yeah, I, I'm in love with this fucking thing. I think I, I more or less love every single song on here and it gets better every time I hear it. So. Mm. Good stuff. Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess I can talk a bit to this uh, record myself. I mean, what immediately captivates me about it uh, and something you mentioned, Tyler, which I think really unlocked a lot of this record for me is like just now is that uh, a lot of these tracks being produced like through jam sessions, because that's something that really jumps out to me about this record, like the bass in particular, I think is consistently really groovy, really impactful. It's really nice. Like, uh, like, uh, it's but like with the opener uh, on the move, that's where you just like get right into the groove of it. Uh, the other black dogs is kind of the, the DNA at the center of this record, this kind of faking a smile, putting on a, on a persona is a lot of the idea here. And the lyrics, like the lyrics in contrast to this really upbeat record paint this really dark seedy facade of a world 
that I, I think is just that I'm absolutely in love with how it's just contrasted with this really dancey, upbeat sound. Like Centerfold hits, it just has this fucking aggressive dance beat. It's so fun. It is pure uh, and, dopamine. That that mm-hmm, the bass sound on that is just pure dopamine. Yeah, it, oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah, and then you've got, then you've got like the reversed chorus on that song, which is just eerie and, and haunting. Uh, and, and just the variety of instrumentals is so nice. Like as, as Jake made the point of, it just doesn't get stale by virtue of that. And like this, this black dog figure at the center, I think is a really interesting point of discussion because I personally interpret this figure as, as kind of like being a personification of like false promises in a sense given to someone through like a relationship or money and status the record industry and i think i think the interpretability of that adds a ton to the universality of just the lyrical messages on this record and how this is going to hit home and connect with you and that that can also be interpreted on like I don't need you, where this false promise can be like this this ex lover, and uh, I mean at the same time this sh- song shows that not everything here is like doom and gloom lyrically. You get this kind of it, while it is somber in a sense, it's it's like this really humorous, fun rebuke, uh, like the line uh, "Your ass is stinky, and you built like a mole." And then we've got, yeah, the next song, Drown, which features uh, Kieran J. Callanan. Uh, and he, he brings this really great eccentricity to his verses, which is just in contrast to Genesis himself. And it, it adds so much to the variety. And, and Gold Chains is like this really fun kind of taking jabs at the bravado of hip hop and this kind of bling rap kind of stuff. Uh, I thought it was a great song. Uh, and the soul influences at the midpoint of the album, Smiling With No Teeth, serves as this great highlight transitioning between these, these kind of two halves of the record as, as Genesis has kind of built it out to be. Uh, side one having a lot of the more upbeat stuff and side two being focused a lot more on the darker societal venting. Uh, and yeah, I don't see color perfectly exemplifying that and the energetic black dogs immediately following that. Uh, but that does kind of get me into a bit of an issue I have with the record that I think there's a couple songs on here where that they're just a bit too short. And I feel he really could have like uh, black dogs. Uh, let's see. Black Dogs Drown, I Don't See Color, feel a bit too short for my taste. They're all like under three minutes and everything else here is like four or five minutes. And I feel you could have really built these songs up and made something even more expansive and exciting with them. Uh, And that's really for me highlighted even more with the song Whip Cracker, which uses its five minute runtime to great effect building up to this really satisfying climax like two minutes into it uh but yeah i think this record does speak to a lot of versatility and and just potential future development for uh genesis i think he's going to be a very very exciting artist to follow in the coming years yeah like i'm shocked to hear this is a debut because it's so accomplished um like he comes on with so much self-belief and personality that you you feel like this must be someone who knows sees the shit because people have told him so um and i i just want to say right up front i think today we're talking about two records that both speak in very different ways to to something in, incredibly relevant to like the contemporary malaise i think um, par- paranormal in obvious ways, but in this one, um, the idea of smiling with no teeth, especially the cover, it feels like it's someone who keeps getting up and life keeps punching them in the face, and they keep going back down and they keep getting back up until all of their teeth have been smashed out, but they're still coming up to have another goal at um, sort of being alive, I guess. 
and no, that, that whole... that's beautiful it's also like um the whole other thing about smiling with no teeth where it's like a fake smile is is usually one that you, you know like like that sort of thing i think of that as well but i never thought of it in terms of like actually having your teeth punched out but i think that's awesome well it's actually uh some of the early tracks have really talked about uh don't need you um that made me think of this uh we've already talked about don't need you quite a lot and for good reason because it is bar none the most fun song any artist has put out this year that i've heard um could this be true i don't I need don't you need, i it's, don't it's, need you is that like ah, unpunched ah. um like idols if they still had a sense of humor vocal delivery <laughs> to the chorus yeah. that makes it work <laughs> yeah um and just the <sighs> The writing is so on point. I love the opening line. Once I left your crazy ass, I took a therapy session. I will be richest in wealth. I'll be rich. I'll be richest in blessings. It's just th- that is that is what it is like <laughs> to like leave a toxic relationship. Uh, right and more yeah. importantly, to get over it, I suppose. Well, you know, and um, yeah, I, just, I I love that. Um, it's a beautifully chaotic chorus. Um, track two, the other black dog. I, I love this song, especially to come after. I also wrote down death grips for on the move. Um, but for the second song to come in and, and be really fun with like this eighties groove that I'd, I'd expect to hear like Jesse Ware drop a verse over. Um, it, it, it was such a shock, and I was like, "Wait, this is a fun record!" I'm, I'm wow. Um, but I love that yes, song. It can be fun. Ah! <laughs> Some of the delivery on "Don't Need You" actually re- re- really reminded me of Merlin from Brockhampton. Yeah, um, yeah. It's not the only time I thought of Brock Hampton on this record. Sugar oh, yeah. came into my head on Waiting on You. Um, I have other notes like that as well. Um, I just want to highlight some songs you haven't really talked about yet that I really enjoyed. Like, um, well, the title track, obviously. Um, beautiful song. And I love the uh, sort of vocalized fills to lead you back into each um, sort of group of bars. Um mm-hmm. Uh, Whip Cracker is uh, a great song with a killer flow. I Don't See Colour is the most sort of frankly political song on the record and addresses the subject with real eloquence and sharp, incisive wit. Um, but two out of the three closing songs, a song about fishing and no looking back, are some of my favourite songs on this fucking record. Um, mainly because they're just really sort of fun and breezy and melancholy, especially a uh, song about fishing is specifically more melancholy, but no, looking back is this breezy pop jam. Um, the title is fairly self-explanatory about what it's about, um, but it's just a great way to close out the record. Um, and yeah, I, I like this record very much. I'm going to go back to it consistently. <laughs> and it's just sort of going right in the, in like my favorites of the year so far. I liked it so much song about fishing that melody man it's just like mm-hmm. ah. Mm-hmm. 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 Ah, fucking ah it, knocks it almost feels like uh like a deep cut on a ween record at points yes i i had that same exact thought <laughs> yes that yeah. it would be like on quebec yeah morgan i'm very curious to hear what your thoughts are on this record well i don't have any hot takes for you today <laughs> The yeah. oven in which takes are baked is out of commission. <laughs> they are cold. It's good. It's very good. Someone turned I off the take it. oven. <laughs> I enjoyed it a lot. Um, yeah. Pretty much everything you all have said to varying degrees, I agree with. Um, the biggest takeaway for me was just that I'm really excited to see what he does next because I I would say the biggest drawback for me is just how all over the place it is. And again, feature, not a bug, but also like, I know you can meld these things in a more cohesive way. And I expect him to do just that on whatever his sophomore record ends up being. So This, this is definitely very much his, um, uh, this feels like his section 80 and whatever will come next will be his good kid Mad City. <laughs> I, funny enough, I was going to say this feels more like his saturation one. Uh, yes, that as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So 
I'm quite pleased with the way these reviews have developed because it means I get to do something which I love to do and that's provide a counterpoint. Um, slightly anyway, not like I'm, I don't massively differ from your opinions because you all know that I love this album. But to me, this isn't the Section 80 or the Saturation 1. This is the Good Kid Mad City and the um, Saturation 2, if you want. This is... Um, I think this record's a masterpiece and it took a while for me to really feel that and understand that. And I have heard some criticisms today that I think are obviously completely fair, but I want to kind of try and counterpoint them or maybe try to make a case for the opposite opinion. Uh, well, not the opposite opinion, but just like, um, intensified of version of our opinion if anything yeah so so one thing I that's agree. come up a couple of times is that people love the sound of this record but they feel it's not um in jake's word it's not too as conceptual or unified as something like forever is a mighty long time by big crit for instance and i disagree and not to you know call anyone out but i really disagree i think this is a very unified and conceptually cohesive record uh, but it did help for me to read some interviews with Genesis and really di dive into the songs. Uh, I wasn't, I was having similar kind of um, feelings of like, I love the sound of this, but I'm not sure what the overall point is until I really kind of dived into it. So hopefully I can make a good case. Um, uh, so as I've already kind of mentioned, uh, Genesis Owusu is a Can uh, Canberra, not Canadian, a Canberra-based <laughs> musician and rapper, um, originally um, from Ghana, so Ghana, Canberra by way of Ghana, uh, who is already making significant waves um, with this record. It's sort of come out of nowhere. Um, and I think it's one of the most uh, incisive and sharp and uh, consistently excellent um, portrayals and um, takes on the issue of race. And it's a really cool perspective to have on the issue of race in Australia, for instance, because I'm not Australian, but I'm keenly aware that um, race is a huge issue in Australia and, and racism is an incredibly deeply rooted systemic problem that manifests in Australian society in ways that I feel like would probably surprise some of you at just how um, bad it is there. And that's not me gloating because, you know, New Zealand and Australia famously have beef and we take shots at each other all the time. New Zealand definitely has its own systemic racial problems, but um, Australia is, is almost um, dystopic to live in if you're a person of color um, in a lot of places. And um, I think that this particular perspective from Genesis on this particular um, manifestation of that world uh, that we're so used to hearing about and primarily in the US and sometimes in the UK as well uh, is a really fresh and uh, invigorating and necessary take. And it's not just that I think this is a masterpiece because it's necessary, but I think that it provides a very sharp and idiosyncratic take on important issues that feels unique in spite of the fact that the issues in question are not necessarily new ones or are certainly ones that are incredibly potent and relevant to a lot of hip-hop and r&b music um but i i think that genesis provides a particularly as i said idiosyncratic and and unique and crucially stupidly talented um perspective and the way that the issues and experiences that he speaks on in this record are so clearly uh, articulated, but also so deeply infused into the sound of the music uh, in some really subtle and, and beautiful ways is something that has revealed itself to me in a huge way the more time I've spent with it. Um, and the record starts with this distorted crackling bass beat and on the move. Uh, that I think has got to be one of the most startling and attention-grabbing openings to an artist's career. That I obviously there was an EP that preceded this by a few years, but I, I think Genesis would agree this is really the beginning um, with this record. And I think to kick off the beginning of your career proper with such a disorienting and ugly sound uh, is totally purposeful and really uh, jarring. And 
Um, don't take this as a negative critique because uh, I'm comparing it to something that I know we all don't really care for, but it reminded me a lot of On Sight, the opening track of Kanye's Yeezus, uh, and that it both sounds like how that track opens and I think has a similar effect of, of deliberately wanting to disorient you. Kanye does it in a meaningful way because he wants to disorient you relative to the music he's made before that point. Um, but that's sort of really all that it is in, in Yeezus, is it's like a meta commentary on like, wow, you didn't expect Kanye to sound like this. Whereas with um, what Genesis does and opening the record in this way with On The Move is both attention grabbing in the same way that what Kanye does on Yeezus is, but it's also meaningful um, and that it's kind of immediately immersing you in this chaotic and noisy and unbearable existence. Um, that is just saturated, no pun intended, by, by the noise of, um, you know, racial hatred and oppression and all of these kind of microaggressions. That's a word that I think uh, sums up a lot of what um, he talks about on this record a lot. These kind of microaggressions and, and, and social, in the social world and, and the interpersonal world that he's kind of experiencing all of the time that are kind of uh, forming this mound of... of uh, that's kind of blocking his view at certain points and makes it difficult to even breathe. Um, and certainly Smiling With No Teeth is a superb title for the record um, for reasons that Saoirse has already articulated beautifully. Um, and we've already kind of talked about um, this idea of having to, of it both representing the need to put up a facade in order to be perceived as normal, to be perceived as sociable, to be perceived as a good person, but also the... Um, uh, a cartoonish representation of the end result of the violence that's inflicted in a physical way um, that's uh, as ridiculous an image or as cartoonish an image as the violence and aggression itself is ridiculous um, on its own. Um, so it's a great title uh, already. I could write a fucking thesis on this record. Um, so yeah, uh, on the move is a great um, short abrasive but gripping intro and I especially love the way that it shows uh, it also previews the complexity of the arrangements that you're going to get on this record because you think it's this on-site like track with and obviously the death grip vocal thing is, is clearly uh, intentional and that's funnily enough the one thing that seems to come up every time I read a review of this record and I think that's intentional like it's a meant to meant to evoke that uh, but I love the way that in the back half of this track you get these really ethereal uh, melodic vocals that are like completely different and add this such a different counterpoint to the record and it's kind of like previewing the way in which this album is going to mix sounds that are incredibly synthetic and ugly and abrasive and just blown out with a real kind of stirring beauty as well um, and um, that is incidentally also a quality that of the other record we're going to be discussing today which manifests in a very different way um, that as Saoirse says, both the records we're discussing in our main episode today have a kind of kinship in a certain way, even if they deal with very different experiences. Um, they have a kind of underlying emotional kinship that I think manifests musically and, and through similar kind of principles of counterpoint. Um, uh, anyway, uh, I want to, I'm going to refer throughout this review to um, interview quotes from Genesis Owusu because I think he puts it better in his own words than me just paraphrasing. I think obviously it's important for his voice to be heard. Um, and he says specifically, the album is called Smiling With No Teeth um, because essentially it's about pretending things are okay when they're not. It tackles these topics of depression, racism, where in my life, talking about it, it often had to be watered down or sugarcoated if, in order to get people to listen to what I'm saying about it. So I wanted to tie that concept into the album by making the album sound sexy and upbeat and fun and danceable we, and then when you actually delve into it, it's a facade, a fake smile, and you get into the core of what I'm actually talking about. And so I think this is one of the great successes of the record in that he seduces you in a certain way with the production of this record. And, um, and certainly with um, the string of songs that follow the intro. Um, and then kind of once you're seduced into it, you start to get that, um, the darker, uglier sounds bubbling to the surface and some of the um, more pop instincty stuff kind of fading back 
Um, and, and so the structure of this record is, is genius, I think. Uh, the Other Black Dog is uh, unequivocally one of the best songs of the year. If it's not on my, it will just be on my end of year songs list because it's that good. Uh, it's based around this really hype ascending synth melody and more of the same kind of propulsive percussion. And on that note, it has to be said, uh, already touched on the way that these songs evolved organically out of jam sessions. So it has to be um, commented what, uh, how fantastic all of the session players are on this record, how lockstep in tune they are with Genesis, how it feels so much like a, a, a solo project, even though it's got all these various musicians kind of giving their own voice to it. It's, it's a real kind of um, band, jazz band feel almost. Uh, even though most of the music isn't jazzy, it just has that kind of camaraderie of a jazz band. Um, Centerfold has basically the sexiest beat I've heard in years. Uh, it, I love the way, and also lyrically, this is a great song. I love the way it turns from a seduction jam in the first verse to a murder fantasy lyrically, um, where he's killing this person that he's um, trying to seduce. And it again reflects that dichotomy that, that flows throughout the record between an attractive or uh, pleasant self-presentation and an ugly underbelly. He's um, seducing you, he's pulling you in, and then he's basically murdering you. Um, and, and, and this is kind of one of the ways in which that is reflected in, in the lyricism as it is reflected in the musical arrangements of this record. Um, uh, I want to shout out uh, Waiting On You, which I don't think has had a lot of um, attention yet, but is uh, just ridiculously addictive. Um, that chorus has been in my head all week long. So I've been waiting, praying on you. You're brooding all along. I've been waiting on you. And again, it's like if you read, sit down and read these lyrics, they're really dark, um, despite the fact that it's so kind of um, uh, pop oriented in the way that it's constructed and the way that the vocal intonations get really catchy in that sort of sense. Um, but it's it's super fucking dark. And I love that dichotomy. And, and it, it doesn't feel uh, like the counterpoint between the darkness and the lightness of the sound is so sharp that it's jarring. It's just like um, the darkness and the lightness of it all. It's so kind of integrated and interwoven. And if that makes any sense, I'm getting a bit it's abstract there. But anyway, great song. Um, Drown is one of the most emotional songs I've heard on a new record in, in quite a while, I'd say. Um, and again, I didn't quite pick up on the real emotion in this song until I really dug into it, because despite the fact that it's so dark, it sounds really triumphant in a way that nothing preceding it on the record does. Um, it uh, has these heavily blown out guitar loop, guitar, guitar clanging loops at its core. And just the sound of them hits a real sweet spot in my brain that it shouldn't. Um, and again, the, the notion of uh, ugly or, or uh, excessive sounds hitting a sweet spot in my brain is a thing that's going to come up again. Uh, in the second record we review today, um, it's just a thing where it's pure dopamine. And, and the cherry on top, as has been mentioned, is the astounding feature from the charismatic Kieran J. Callanan. Uh, on a lesser artist track, he would steal the show, and he doesn't. Uh, he just fits, is, is part of a fa the fabric of the song, and it's, it's perfect. And also, he, it fits, but also the song would feel empty if he weren't there. It's like a perfect case of knowing where to put this feature to make the song perfect, but also not relying on the feature to do that. It's just fucking 10 out of 10. In fact, I would say, as much as I love the entire album, the run of tracks from The Other Black Dog to Drown is just one of the best runs of songs on a new record in years. Um, just purely flawless. Um, uh, the first half of the album ends with the Slow Jam title track, which, uh, as August mentioned, is actually intended to be an intermission that is um, uh sort of serving as a bridge between the two halves of the album. And in terms of album structure, I'm going to go back to um, an interview with Genesis to, who, to let sort of Genesis speak on that. He says, quote, the first half of the album deals with the internal black dog, which is depression. These are the songs where specifically, sonically, it's a bit more ambitious. The sonics are more upbeat and at points sensual to complement his personality of wanting to lure you in and be your only one. Um, in the same, in a sense, serving as a kind of metaphor for the way that um, the darkness become of, of depression becomes so inescapable and so um, 
it sort of pulls you along like some kind of seductive um, evil creature, uh, a black dog, the way that that's represented, but also um, the other black dog, the, the symbol of racism is the what is represented on side two of the record. As he says, on side two, the mask is off. The second black dog takes the second half of the album in a more direct direction. Uh, it deals with the brunt of racism and oppression, and it's angry. It's more in your face than the more lurking personality of the internal black dog. And this is really where I think the genius of the album um, hits its kind of highest point in the sense that the sound of the record uh, in, in its two halves is directly, every aspect of it is directly intended to reflect the different disparate experiences of these two black dogs and the way that they in their own way um, contribute to um, making the world this hellish place for Genesis to live in. Um, whether it's in a more subtle and seedy way with um, the first half or whether it's in a more uh, outwardly violent way with the second half of the record. And I think that uh, one thing that's been spoken about is that the second half, some of the songs in the second half of the record are maybe a bit shorter than they should be for some people, or, or they'd prefer if they're a bit fleshed out. But for me, um, the shortness of a track like um, uh, Black Dogs, for instance, is very purposeful and, and integral to the effect. Uh, Black Dogs is a short two minute rager it's almost like a punk track in a sort of sense. It's intended to summarize a day in a Wusu's life. The typical profiling and microaggressions that decorate and define life in Australia if you're a person of color. And the speediness of it, the um, intensity and the, and the swift ending of it is, is integral to um, the overall attempt to convey an overwhelmingness and a difficulty to catch up uh, in spite of everything that's happening. And, uh, I think it's so good. Um, the minimal I don't see color opens the second half, and um, in uh, in Owusu's words, so much of Act One had honey and sweetness and upbeat tracks, but we ripped that all away. It showcases the personality of the next black dog, which is more direct and brutal. They have faced the brunt of racism, and there's no more sugar coating. The extremely minimal instrumental is intentional, so you can completely focus on the lyrics, which are much more scathing. Uh, being a black person in white society and having to experience the brunt of racism, I'm often also expected to be the bigger person and the educator. So this arc is validating the emotions and the venting that should be allowed. It's therapeutic when you're faced with those circumstances. And again, the brevity is crucial. The length, the, the length of the songs in the first half is intentional to the effect of the seductive, um, black dog of depression kind of pulling you in or the black dog of some kind of internal darkness pulling you in it needs to be slow and sultry to represent how that uh, gradually becomes a trap whereas it needs to be the opposite of that in the second half to represent the violence of this other um form of 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 um you know pain um Whipcracker has these funk influenced guitar licks and this distorted tone, which is pure psychedelia. It's difficult not to draw comparisons to the Australian psychedelic band, which is Tame Impala, or at least their first two albums anyway. But what Awusu is doing is completely in its own line, fusing and integrating so many other styles of music and cultural influences that it's practically impossible to unpack them all in a single listen. Uh, the off-kilter vocal styles he tries on the track Easy are both funny and fun. They just add more shades to his charisma and personality. And with the um, taking on the perspective of others in some tracks on the back half of this as well, you get, again, more of that personality and more of that talent and diversity in what he's able to do um, getting shown off. Such that even though the first half has this run of amazing, perfect songs, I think the second half is just as good for me. Uh, I love the unexpected prettiness of a, of a song about fishing, which reminds me of some of Panda Bear of Animal Collective solo material at points. Uh, no Looking Back is a triumphant climax with an absolutely ridiculous horn arrangement that elevates it into this um, jazzy, purely wild realm. Um, but this ending of No Looking Back, in Owusu's words, is too Hollywood. 
um, you need to have the crawl back to a dreary reality that is represented by the closing track Bye Bye, which has some of the darkest lyrics on the record. I close my eyes to disease, convince myself that I don't mind. A rolling stone of hidden pleas balled into a landmine. How do I breathe with my hands on my own throat? How do I cry a stream, then drown when I know that I see a boat? How do I end up sinking inside the warmth of all this praise? How do I crash inside the steel when I was piloting the plane? How do I glide with angel wings that's burning all up in the flames? How do I never take a loss if all I'm playing is a game? How do I throw myself in water I never knew how to swim? How do I ever cast a judgment when I'm seeping in the sin? Amazing lyricism on this closing track. So good. And it's such a beautiful moment of self-reflection as well as summary for both the, uh, the aspects of societal unease of the second half of the record and the obviously the aspects of interpersonal unease that are um, in those lyrics that I just quoted as well. This thing is a fucking masterpiece. I'm utterly convinced of it at this point. And I'm only convinced that it will age better and better with time and uh, frankly, my concern is not necessarily um, that I'm excited. Obviously, I'm excited for where he goes from here, but my concern is more that for me, I'm, I'm going to be very intrigued to see how he reaches this level uh, in two consecutive records or even whether the idea of topping it is possible for me. It, it, it's um, absolutely outrageously fantastic. And I have to thank... Um, in particular, I had to thank April for putting it, our mutual friend April for putting it on my radar. I did see that it was blowing up on Rate Your Music, but it was April's endorsement that really pushed me to listen to it. And in some Thanks, respects, April. and in some respects, is probably the reason that we're discussing it as soon as we are. Um, but yeah, what an album! Uh, I, yeah, I what a in, record! I am in absolute awe of it, yeah. and I uh, love that it exists. And and fucking how this year is just. This month, mm. especially this year, has just esc- I mean, I've had a this shit- fucking week. This uh, week, yeah. today. It's it's funny. I've had like a terrible month personally, but like as yeah. my, my life has been getting shittier, the music that's coming out has been getting it's getting better. better. What the fuck is yeah. that all about? Yeah. So I, you know I what? Think, I'll take it. Yeah, I think it's certainly true with this record and the next one. The certain sex of online music discourse. In like three years, it will be incredibly cool to have uh, either of these records in your like topster uh, for both yeah. of those like subsets. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, um, yeah, you, you're you're absolutely right. Like, this is the, both of these records we're talking about today are the future of music. And and yes, I kind of was joking to myself while listening to this this morning that that basically today's the rim court the rate your music episode of um the jams and tea podcast because both of these are albums that that site has um helped in a huge way to garner the attention that they've got um but you know what fuck it i I still have um deep seated in the back of my head i think like (laughs) way back when we started the podcast when we did our one of our early episodes we got a comment that said tyler has such rate your music taste (laughs) we did and that has seeded into my head ever since then. Because I'm <laughs> you know, those... it's, it's funny that they say that because it's like, I, and I'm not saying this because of your friend, you really don't. <laughs> I think I just um, am really kind of in tune with online communities like that. And that's the reason why yeah. um, I, I guess I was sort of onto these records quickly. Although actually both of these records, it's kind of, Rim is, right, I need to stop calling it Rim. rim. Rate Your Music is kind of incidental to the reason that I've gone into these records. The reason I've gone into these records we're talking about this week is because people I know- McDonald's. Care, people I know and care about recommended them. So um, yes, this is the Rate Your Music episode, but it's also the episode where um, people that are in this group and people that are not in this group that we care about um, get to champion and introduce us to awesome albums that we get to um promote yeah. mm-hmm. um, okay, at one point on this docket we had the justin bieber album and the lana del rey record. we did that's oh, so true those were, the, those were the two placeholder records for this week and and what a fucking and it's funny night because, and day holy it's fun, shit it, it, it's funny because both the albums we're discussing 
this week don't fit the typical mold of they came out last Friday. We have a week with them. These are albums. Mm. The Genesis Awusu album came out at the start of this month and the Paranormal mm. album came out last month. But it doesn't matter. Like if we're late catching up, who yeah. cares? It's still, we yeah. still get to talk about these awesome and- records. Okay, let's do our favorite tracks and ratings then for um, Genesis Awusu's uh, Smiling With No Teeth. Uh, Jake, why don't you let us off? My three favorite tracks are No Looking Back, uh, Don't Need You, and the other black dog. Least favorite? Ah, easy. I don't fucking know. Every song on here is good. Who gives a shit? Uh, nine out of ten. Sick. August. Good stuff. Yeah, uh, my three favorite tracks on here would be uh, a song about fishing, Centerfold, and Whipcracker. Uh, least favorite probably uh, black dogs on the second half uh, for reasons stated um, rating is a 7.5 out of 10 oh indeed Morgan yeah uh, my three favorites are uh, fucking uh, uh, don't need you drown and gold chains um, my least favorite I can't lie. I'm not crazy about the beat on Centerfold. Uh, I go. To, I could go to jail. I will. <laughs> uh, eight and a half out of ten. My favorite songs on it are on this one are uh, "Don't Need You." Uh, I'm also going to shout out "No Looking Back." And, uh... My apologies. I just looked down, look up, and Jake's face is just right in the yeah. camera. <laughs> Um, and I'm gonna shout out I don't see color Um, and my least favorite I don't know gold chains or some shit it's getting an 8.5 from me (laughs) my three favorite tracks are (laughs) um, are gonna be the other black dog uh, centerfold and this is my favorite scene in the Dark Knight. I was, I was about say, to fucking. <laughs> I, I, I was gonna say will die. I was gonna say requiem. For, I was gonna say requiem for a dream, but here we are. Um, <laughs> the other black dog, centerfold, and um, drown. <laughs> and my least favorite track is um, I don't have one, and this is a fucking ten. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Simple we kill the Batman. So that's an 8.7 average racing. And get this. Yeah. Go farther and lightness. All right, stop that. I, I drove a line at your mouth. Swans is filth. <laughs> Go farther and lightness. That, that was Iridescent. filthy. Iridescence forever in your heart. Some fucking Jake core sure. shit right there. It's fucking bangers. And speaking so. of bangers. Our okay. next album this week comes all the way from South Korea. Uh, this is, of course, the sophomore effort from Korean uh Emo Shugay's uh, one uh, project from a nameless Korean student who, as his band camp puts it, writes music in his free time, uh, Paranual, roughly through Google Translate, translating into English as Blue Glow, although that could be wildly inaccurate. And this is their uh, second album to see the next part of the dream. And as mentioned before, this is kind of a very emo inflected shoegaze album. And as he has put his influences down for this record, coming from uh, films like uh, All About Lily Chow Chow, uh, television shows like Neon Genesis, Evangelion, and uh, Welcome to the NHK, and manga like uh, Good Night Pun Pun. So, and I think yeah, all I know, of those- I know what those things are. Yeah, <laughs> but that that's for the weebs, uh, Jake and myself. But yeah, I would be, cool. so that's, that's kind of 
where this is coming from, I would love to hear what you all think about it. Yeah, I'll, 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 because I listened to this album because it had a featured review on uh, Rate Your Music, and I was like, I saw it and I was like, Korean shoegaze emo? What is? It's rated at the moment, as when I read it, number six for the year. It has since gone up to one and then back down to three. Um, quite justifiably because this album fucking rules. stolen stolen as ever by an I atmospheric I, I black not... metal album <laughs> yeah, that, yeah that like 400 people have rated or something i wouldn't yeah, be surprised. Exactly. it's always fucking black metal on these sites man i wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if once the dust settles and some a few months have gone by that you see this record rising again depending on what else fucking happens this yeah. year who fucking knows well the the other album that's ahead of it is black country new road um, yeah, that's that's just a record that has an obsessive fan base. Boy, do I know it. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> Who could that be? I don't know. Um, but, oh, I don't. Um, the, uh, one of the key things that really made me enjoy this record is when I first listened to it, uh, someone translated all of the lyrics into English and put up a YouTube video where they synced the lyrics coming on screen with the lyrics in the song. Um so I could sort of read along like subtitles, um, which Jesus wet the lyrics on this album are so good. Um, uh, like in the second song, excuse you have the repeated refrain, the world is beautiful, even trash like me continues to live on. Um, on one of the songs, um, there we go, Youth Rebellion. It's one of the more up-tempo songs on the record, but some of the lyrics include repeated self-insults, uh, such as the string, loser, jobless, virgin, jackass, fucking dickhead, antisocial, uh, hikik, hikikmori, which is a Japanese word me meaning, um, basically, a man who never goes outside and interacts with the public. Um, and it's, if you follow along the whole, with that, the whole album is imbued with this sense of... Um, being lost from the world and sort of drifting through uh, a, a pointless youth um, and the sort of alienation that comes like that through some of the opener um, Beautiful World and track three analog sentimental analog sentimentalism really effectively um, describe a state of having a mediated reality um, be that through your own fantasy or um, previous recordings of the reality like Polaroid photos um, you feel detached from your reality because there is something uh, dreamlike holding you back from it title to face the other side to see the other side of the dream begins to take on a particular relevance in that context um, it, which is a lyric that gets quoted a couple of times on the record I think um, but really the key appeal of this record is the guitar tones <laughs> and the heavy fuss which is joyous um the first time i listened to this record was the same week i listened to uh loveless and slow dive self-titled for the first time purely by coincidence ah uh, uh. and the level of satisfying tone is at least aiming for that status i think even if those are two classic records, I guess, but it's aiming for sort of that ballpark, I suppose. Um, and by and large, it hits the targets it wants to hit. A song like Analog Sentimentalism is probably the most like accessible song on the record, um, making the best use of that strange like eight bit synth lead it incorporates sometimes. Um, it's just this incredibly uh, sort of fun, joyous uh, points that sort of feels like um, a sh I wrote my notes, a shoegaze version of the Scott Pilgrim, the movie, the game, 8-bit soundtrack. Um, yes. Um, yeah, and it, it just feels like um, the nostalgia, the, the way the lyrics describe a nostalgic mediation of reality through recorded photos is so perfectly captured in the way the music feels. It feels like you are looking back on beautiful summers gone past. And these complex fuzzy guitar tones really evoke that feeling of melancholy nostalgia and knowing sort of the nostalgia is bad, it's, it's indulging it anyway. It's not even just like there's the beautiful looking back there's a, the beauty of the sound and the beauty of the memory and the beauty of the 
imagery that's captured in, in terms of the beauty of the world. Um, but I love the way that that's so intertwined with um, the production style of this record, which is deliberately corrosive and like it's trying to erode and undermine all the beauty of the sounds of the record. And that to me is the emotional um, core of, of the album where it's like you have these beautiful things, this beautiful world as the, as the first track states, you have this um, rich and gorgeous thing to, that you're in awe of, that you're able to exist within, that you're able to bask in, but that is totally, uh, you're held at a distance from, uh, you're unable to fully engage with because of the wall of uh, internal turmoil that is keeping you like a prisoner from it. And that exactly is why I've seen some takes that like people love the sound of the instrumentation and the, and the melodies and stuff, but that the production style, the mixing deliberately holds them back from the record. And it's like, you're close to an epiphany there. And this was yeah. an epiphany I had to have as well, because I fit, similarly, the first time I heard this record, I felt at a distance from it. But then I, I had that epiphany where it was like, that's the point of the album. That's the reason it sounds like the, the way that it does, because it's not trying to uh, relate to you in a certain sense. It's trying to fully immerse you in a very particular subjective experience of the world. And I think it does that better than most albums I've heard in my life. I think that's a really beautiful way to describe it. And the reason earlier I said that this record fits into um, like a, a contemporary zeitgeist, I suppose, is that I think at the moment, um, um, and I saw other people commenting on this, um, is that, I mean, ob there's the obvious whole thing of pandemic stuck inside, detachment from reality, isolation, confinement, but there's also the aspect of so many people of our generation um, have in a way been denied futures our parents enjoyed so well and have been denied so many opportunities to live sort of to the fullest extent that we could do through actions outside of our control and so depression is an e like an epidemic in our generation I suppose um, and that's an aspect of uh, that I get through the music of this record of um, being out of step with the world and being held back, um, be that through mental illness or through forces outside of my control, from living, I suppose. And in a way, the reference to Hik Hikikmori is so sort of on point there. Some people consider it a mental illness of not, you know, I don't like shit, I don't go outside, you know. Um, yes, exactly. It's, it's, a, it's a bit like that. Um, yeah, and um, I also love how later on in the record they begin to incorporate more acoustic instrumentation, be that piano on the white ceiling or acoustic guitar also. And um, there's one song that uh, made me almost think of like the last Deftones record, but there are also songs that um, start off acoustic and then burst into a wall of sound and it's electrifying. Um, I can into I can intellectualize the appeal of this record all day, but if I just want to throw in this record with the lyrics I don't understand and just listen to the beautiful music, it is a viscerally exciting experience, while at the same time being incredibly sad. And the detachment, which Tyler talks so well about, and the alienation is all a part of that. It's all a part of how this record uh, fully immerses you in a world and a life experience, which maybe isn't yours, but maybe straight closer to home than you want it to. And it's just such an electrifying emotional experience for me. Well said. Thank you. That's a good way to put that. As I'm glad you did it too, because uh, I'm going to be totally honest here. I didn't look at the lyrics. Oops. Oopsie <laughs> daisy. That said, um, <laughs> it's not like we've been beating around the bush or anything. <laughs> it's not like we've been beating around the bush on this one or anything, but... um. I like this record a fair bit, uh, and I'm going to be listening to it multiple times after this podcast, so it's not like it's going to be something that's like, oh no, really missed the train on that one, maybe I would have enjoyed it more. It's like, no, 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 no. Um, this this will just be another level I can unearth from it, because frankly, I'm really glad that Tyler and Sersha did that, because that was sort of my, like, I was just going to sort of attempt to, like the uh, metal record we reviewed last week, I sort of, you know, the uh, lyrics and that you sort of see as like a, a texture to the rest of it. And that's sort of how I thought about it here. But like, 
in terms of how like the production and the sound like coalesce together that was sort of my thinking of the like this is uh very much like it has all those inspirations uh like very japanese like um coming of uh age kind of stuff i was going to say that this uh again weeb thing so only well morgan will get it too but this to me sounds like uh the anime anohana which is you know an, an anime coming of age story which is very much about a lot of the things that are uh thematically touched upon here uh you know just also things like you know you have this sort of that that sound that's sort of the 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 tenor of the album is the whole like faded nostalgia thing um i think the best way to put it is that it's a very very rough fuzzy sounding version of the sound you're going to find on the world is a beautiful place so i'm no longer afraid to die i think this album is deeply deeply indebted to um uh the uh, their album whenever if ever uh, which is a good, good, good thing because more albums should be, frankly, um, especially in those like little electronic uh, elements that sort of like 8-bit synth lead that Sarah should describe, I find also to be on those uh, albums like almost all the time. Uh, and that's just a sound that I obviously really, really love and gravitate towards. Um, and honestly, like I get the production not working for people. Um, it kind of worked on me from the outset though there's something about the way this is so cluttered and and so like abrasive that it creates its sort of own distinct dreaminess like listening to this with a good pair of headphones in like a very clear headspace is a fucking transcendent out of body experience as far as i'm concerned just like kicking back in your bed like this is shoegaze at it as it is meant to be traditionally enjoyed uh and, and i think it's just absolutely fucking astonishing i love how it's not afraid to despite the fact that it's dreamy and it's shoegazy it's not afraid to have riffs especially on that front half that just honestly fuck it go it just like really hard shit and also it's just sort of like i love the the vocal intonations and sort of how um uh, disparate and occasionally like atonal they can be. This is like the shoegaze equivalent of taking two negative numbers and multiplying them together and getting a positive outlook. It's like you have this sort of uglier production and the sort of atonal vocals and you just sort of mix them together and they become this own dreamy otherworldly thing, the likes of which I haven't really heard a combination of before. And it's just, it's something that scratches such a very particular itch and I'm such a fucking nut for shoegaze stuff that I, 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 I ate this up. I, I really, really love this album. Uh, and I can't really uh, go further than that, like thematically, just because that's clearly a layer that I have yet to fully unspool. But still, I mean, yes, there are lots of things that could potentially hold you at arm's length here. But if this sounds like something that you're interested in, I want you to give this a shot and then give it another shot later if you're not fully into it, just to be certain, because I could see so many people, so many fucking loving this shit and the fact that it's like i'm glad it got that pitchfork review and is getting some buzz but like i it, it's not enough i want this to be seen by by more people because it's such a unique version of this sound and as someone who wants shoegaze to go in like all of these interesting places please 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 let this take off i i am in love with this sound this record this yeah, band I think it's, everything i think it's certainly worth saying that well for me i liked it the first time i heard it but every yeah. time I've listened to it, my rating has gotten higher. Yeah, um, same. There's just always more levels to unpack with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Totally. I think that's an integral part of the experience with the album. Uh, unless you're Jake and it just clicks in instantly. But like, I, <laughs> but yeah. But still, I, I liked it more now. Yeah. So, you know. I would like, uh, I'm presuming August kind of maybe wants to go last on this, just because I presume he has the most to say. So I'm going to ask if Morgan wants to give his opinion before I do. Because I have lots to say and I don't want to steal points as well. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> so the thing about this album, uh, related to what we were talking about a bit earlier, um, is that I also did not read the lyrics very closely. Um, but I've actually just pulled them up in the course of this conversation here. And 
it's I'm looking at it and it's like yeah it it helps but also the the music communicated so much of this so well just yes. by itself that like I what I'm saying is is that this album goaded um, <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's pretty just spectacular um I I, I guess I understand the production uh, hangups, but it ain't me. Um, it's kind of just how shoegaze works for me. I mean, I don't know. I don't. I don't really see it being. I don't really hear that much of a difference between like this and my bloody Valentine in terms of like mixing. Um, That's I, don't know, I find them. I find them to be sort of equally pushing you away while trying to pull you in at the same time. Um, so I don't know. Maybe stop being a scrub. Uh, <laughs> fucking yes, yeah, I just I don't I don't have a whole lot to add to this. It just it just gets me feeling a certain type of way, and that way is despondent. Be like, like rad wimps if it was shoegaze. Yeah, just just a just a wall of fuzz over the your name soundtrack, which sounds like, fucking ideal. amazing. <laughs> ideal, frankly. Does music get yep. better than that? I would also like to say, um, you know, obviously go support this artist on like Bandcamp and everything, but like get the highest possible quality version of this to listen to as you possibly can getting the mp3 the 320 mp3s for these like just sort of it, it was much better than like streaming in like the youtube video or just front like it's just ah oh, the sound the sound the sound is so fucking good man yeah i uh first yeah. time i listened to this was the 320 mp3 and then i listened to it again with the flex um, oh. and, and you might not think that with a record that is designed to sound the way that this is, that that makes a difference, but it really does. Um, I agree. It, it's yes. like, yeah, pe- there is still a difference between high fidelity and low fidelity, even with a record that is engineered to sound as, um, for lack of a better word, ear splitting as this. Mm-hmm. Um, I, so yeah, I definitely recommend if you're going to go and buy the record on Bandcamp, the cool thing about Bandcamp is that when you buy a record, they let you download it as many times as you want in whatever format you want to download it. So I'd say uh, if you want to have the MP3 for your iPhone or whatever, but you want to have the flack for listening on your computer like me, I recommend doing that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, just, I don't, like, maybe that's what it is. Maybe they just haven't gone deaf enough to really let this sink in. Um, but yeah, I think, it, you know, it's unfair because Nick Cave had <clears throat> a song this year. Uh, so I, I unfortunately cannot say that Beautiful World is my favorite song of the year so far, but like Jesus Christ almighty, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just yeah, yes. And the thing is, they're all mostly that good. So it's, it's just, just kind of spoiled for choice here. Um, Somebody who's been fucking snorting shoegaze for the last like 10 months of my life. This was the fucking like kick in the ass that I needed. I was just like, you know, I think I've discovered most of what I think this genre really uh, like has to offer. And then this, I was just like, whoa, whoa, yo. <laughs> Let's go. Mr. Paranool was like, you thought. And then he went back to, I don't know, crying or something. I don't know what he does. Uh, yeah, probably what we do. Cry. Hashtag relatable activities. Um, that kills me too, because he's like, I just made this in my free time. I'm like, I'm sorry? You mean this wasn't <laughs> your life's work? <laughs> <laughs> like you're telling me you aren't a 50 year old man who's been making music since you were like an infant and then you finally just like spawned your masterpiece after so long do, do you want to run that by me again yeah um and citizen kane being made when orson wells was 25 type beat look okay so i guess i'll speak on this album for a bit now um 
so yeah i had an interesting experience with this album the first time i was uh absolutely overwhelmed by it as i expect most people who encounter this record probably will be uh it is as i said ear splitting uh it is designed and engineered in a way that makes it sound um painful and i don't think that is being dishonest or even inherently critical because um the fact of the matter is i don't have a critical thing to say about this album in the slightest um every single time i've listened to it i have felt that it has struck into my heart deeper and deeper uh, and now i'm at the point where this record feels imbued in my dna um to be a bit abstract and silly uh but yeah um one thing that i think is interesting um i won't go too much into the backstory because august is sort of already kind of touched on some of it and I think we'll probably probably mention a wee bit more when uh, August reviews it but uh, one thing I found a bit, a bit really interesting about the backstory of this is that um, the well the creator of this record is, is very reclusive we do not know their identity uh, we don't even know if any other people were involved in the making of it um, but it seems to be this kind of one person project uh, and one detail I found interesting is that not even their parents are aware that they make music. Um, and, and, and presumably for someone young, um, that would be, uh, in making music like this, that would be a kind of difficult thing to keep completely hidden from other people in your world. But this is so clearly this private and, and um, deeply cathartic expression for this person. Uh, and another thing that's interesting as well, it's already come up that it's like, how did this person kind of make this in their spare time? Morgan said, how is this not like the summation of life's work? And I think that like the answer there is that while it didn't maybe take a life to actually physically create, it is the product of um, the lifetime of this person's experiences and emotions and feelings um, and specifically uh, tender uh, coming of age experience as well. Um, in, imbued in the fabric of this record and I simply don't believe it's possible for someone who hasn't experienced that kind of turmoil um, and, and the things that this person has clearly experienced even if we don't specifically know what they are to have created this because it's so um, it's so overwhelmingly unalgorithmic so absurdly human that it is um such a, a unique and invaluable document that kind of doesn't make sense because lots of things are obviously um human but like it, it's difficult to describe the way that this feels like i think i said earlier it's less that someone is trying to relate to you and more that someone is is trying to orally induce their subjective experience within anyone who uh, has an open enough mind and picks up this record. Um, there will be people for whom this is absolutely unlistenable. And uh, I likely expect that those people probably may, may not necessarily be able to fully relate to some of the sentiments that are being expressed on it anyway. It's a record that I think, um, not to be elitist or anything like that, but I do think that um, the a great deal of the appeal of this record is the extent to which it in a very direct and sensory way um, completely locks into uh, very specific emotional experiences that I'm sure a lot of people can relate to. Um, and uh, I think is the reason that this has latched onto so many people so quickly, myself included. Um, in terms of the musical sound and, and influence of this record, um, Loveless has come up multiple times, fittingly. Um, and this is a shoegaze record through and through. I think it's interesting that Loveless came out 30 years ago this year. Its anniversary will be uh, in November. And um, another ridiculously great addition to the 1991 canon. Um, yeah. But uh, that the sound of that record when it came out, though I obviously cannot claim to have been on the ground floor there. Um, but I know enough through... Um, historical osmosis and experience to understand that the, the, the sound of that record when it was released was disorienting. Um, people didn't really know what to do with it. Uh, it, it was engineered to sound in a very specifically unique and different way to anything that had come before it. 
Um, it, it sounded so unique and yet it connected with people despite that to such a strong extent that if not spawning a new genre, it basically kick-started um, a, a lengthy wave of music in the very same way that the Velvet Underground and Nico did. Um, and I think that uh, to see the next part of the dream is the loveless of the 2020s. Uh, I think that it is the same, it will have, I hope that it will have the same kind of impact, perhaps it being less novel will, will detract from that, but I think that it is unique in the same ways. I think that it connects in the same ways, and I think that it represents something um, entirely new in the same ways, despite having that shoegaze lineage. Um, I, I said on, on Twitter that um, I think this is one of the most significant records of the century so far i don't even care that i'm being hyperbolic um because the more i listen to it the more i come to understand the fabric of this record the stronger i believe that um this is something that very rarely happens um it's it's so rare that you get something that comes along that is so i mean obviously the, the precedent for music is is almost always evident but like it so feels like a completely new sensory experience that I've never gotten from music before. And yet it's so musically and, and melodically and in terms of song construction, so accomplished that it's, it's very difficult to believe it's not the work of a seasoned um, veteran. It, 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 it is such an astonishing feat. Um, uh, another record that comes to mind um, that this reminds me of in terms of landing with the same kind of impact and coming from the same kind of um, set of historical antecedents but completely feeling like a new thing is Sunbather by Deaf Heaven um, and, and when that hit in 2013 and completely upended alternative music culture, opened up the world of black gaze and black metal and stuff to a completely new audience, completely shifted um, the perception of a style of music within the culture, and then went on to inspire legions of, of um, new acts. And I only can expect and hope that this will do the same. Um, and it, not even just it feeling like a similar moment in alternative music to that record. Uh, it reminds me of the experience I had with that record when it came out. Um, uh, I listened to, De to Sunbather on the, the day of that my very first long-term relationship ended when I was 16 and I was an emotional wreck and Sunbather came along and um, combine harvested my soul um, and, and this feels like it's doing that as well. It's coming at a point where I'm in a similarly fragile and, and desperate place. And it's, and it's, it's just landing and, and connecting in a way that feels so appropriate for me personally, but also clearly is resonating with so many other people in the same way. Um, it's astounding how affecting this record is. Um, there are consistent moments of sheer glorious musical release um, that are all over this thing. Uh, I don't find I don't find that there's a single weak moment on it. Um, uh, I think of when I think of this record, I don't necessarily think of tracks as I think of like uh, sheer experiences throughout the record. The relentless upward surge of white ceiling, which is one of the most astounding um, compositions on a shoegaze record ever um, in history. Uh, my favorite track here continues changing each time I listen to the record. Um, but at the moment, it's Age of Fluctuation, which is this astounding. Um, emotional track that has this visceral rise throughout it and there's this indescribable sequence in this track towards the end where um, the vocalist is just screaming at the top of his lungs and the distortion that's lathered over top of everything and I think I've already said basically as well as I could ever possibly say why I think the production style of this record works but I'll reiterate that it's 
the instrumentation is is the sort of the beauty of the world and the production the distortion that's lathered over everything is the prison gates that are holding this person at a distance from it um where that beauty that serenity is unattainable um and it's not a record about being deluded or pretending that someday it is quite a dark record it's because i think uh paranormal has specifically said that it's there is no delusions of freedom here it's a record that's cogently conscious of this perspective of uh hope being of of, there be, of, of feeling hopeless and not pretending that there might be an upside and just simply existing in the raw emotion of um in the raw lostness of how this person is feeling and in those screams in age of fluctuation it, it's it's this truly it feels like if we were to continue this prison bar metaphor it feels like trying to fruitlessly bend those bars and stick your head through into the sunshine and feeling the limitations of your ability to do that and it's just one of the most unbelievably cathartic and raw and just the words are almost cliche at this point to describe what it is but it is just all of those things in a way that feels so much more for lack of a better word, truthful than a lot of music that attempts to go for the same thing. And I can't necessarily point to why this record succeeds in a way that a lot of artists who try to do similar things don't, at least not to this level. Um, but it's it's that kind of experience, that kind of feeling is in every single track on this record. Um, uh, one other thing I want to shout out is um, just the sound of the guitars on this record is just is just astonishing. I think a track like Chicken reminded me of Smashing Pumpkins in particular, yeah. um, uh, which I thought was a really cool reference point. Um, yeah, just this relentless incorporation of really layered, fuzzy, and just thicker than a fucking elephant's leg guitar tones are just so fantastic. And, and and I think I've already explained why the production style works, but it is worth emphasizing um, for people who perhaps haven't heard this record, that this is a really extreme sounding record. Like every time I finish listening to this, I've been in physical pain because yeah. the way to experience this is to play it loud. And if you're not playing it loud, you're not getting the full effect of it. But at the same time, it, it you know, it, it, it will probably leave you with lasting hearing damage to some extent if you feel it as much as I do. Songs anyway. for the deaf tight beat. Um, but that clipping in it, that distortion, um, it, it's so integral to the effect of the record in a way that other artists who try to utilize that aesthetic um, never of seldom, if ever, truly get. And it's a really delicate act to tread because you could end up making something that sounds like pure shit um but it just doesn't it, 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 i mean it, it it does sound all of those things but it's what makes it work and it's difficult to explain why that does but i think i already did anyway and i'm just talking myself in circles now so i'm gonna wind down uh this is was a transformative album for me um this is my album of the year uh and i said i think when we reviewed black country new road that i would be astonished if I heard a record this year that I thought was more perfect than that, front to back. And this is simply it. Um, so I, I was sitting there that time and I was just thinking like, I'm not gonna say it, but I fucking know there's gonna be another one. I fucking know. Well, well, Black Country New Road simply ain't all that. <laughs> no, Black Country, Black Country New Road is all that. And it's an important record and all that yada 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 i still stand firmly on everything i said with regard to that record but this i think so far at least will go down to be the most significant album of this year and i'm i would love to eat those words but i can't i, I can't imagine something coming along that feels more like a paradigm shift than this um and you know 2021 do your best but even if you don't you're all you're already goaded because of, of yep. this and yeah. uh i i i bow at the feet 
of, of a record like this and I words fail me not that this qualifier necessarily means anything because it's kind of an empty thing now to say this but I think this is better than Sunbather and I think this is better than Loveless and this is my favorite shoegaze album and that's also a category that includes the first two Twilight Sad albums so this is the level of love that I have for this thing and yeah the only reason I'm not fucking screaming about it is the fact that I don't want to necessarily detract any more <laughs> from other people's perspectives on this record than I have so I'm going to shut up now and let August speak okay so yeah that uh that that aforementioned character which has been uh repeatedly mentioned so so often throughout this video I wanted to uh I felt it necessary to open this off by reading uh the exact words of uh Mr. or Mrs. Paranual who uh their exact words to describe this character uh just as like a preface uh this album is about a person whose body is an adult but mind is still a child due to the wide gap between ideal and reality he believes he is talented and he thinks that he will definitely become a world tour rock star in the future in reality however he had never played guitar a guitar while he was 21 his singing skills are fucking awful and his below average height and appearance and everything how will he react now now that he has faced reality as an adult after adolescence and this album opens up with the lush haze of beautiful world i mean what's of course striking about this record to me is the mix of the drums with electronic droning paired with this thick compression and reverb uh this makes for a very grand encompassing oppressive sound as has been described before it is noisy it is aggressive it is unfriendly and uncomfortable lyrically the record is bleak of course using living in a dream perhaps one not even of your own design as a metaphor for mundanity and repetitiveness track two escape hits us with an aggressive guitar part during the chorus of note each song on here sounds very distinct from what comes before and after but at the same time i still couldn't imagine listening to this album in a context other than the whole thing it is such a complete encompass encompassing experience of a record then we've got for the third track track analog sentimentalism which is absolutely my favorite song of the year so far the whistling synthesizer buried in this song's mix gives a beautiful warm nostalgic feel that i can only compare to the sound of, that i can only compare to what is invoked what is invoked by the band boards of canada for me uh lyrically it speaks to having some physical need to cling on to the past. Uh, and the transition here between this and white ceiling is so stunningly purposeful with an alarm clock ringing to kind of wake up from the dream. This is the record's, one of the record's big transition points. Uh, white ceiling is this stunning, monstrous 10 minute one of the record's stunning monstrous 10 minute long centerpieces. Uh, in, this, in songs like this one, the, the runtime benefits like the instrumentation very well because everything is developed and the listener can really appreciate how meticulous the mix of this record is, which is something I think goes a bit undersold in online discussion of this record, just how tight and purposeful every everything is in terms of the leveling where it is relative to everything else uh and it legitimately takes a minute to parse through the dense mixes and sound play on here i think it's it, it's rare that an album that should sound this cluttered feels so it it feels so purposeful 
and it doesn't feel like it's born out of an artist's lack of proficiency with the tools they're using. It feels like such a, a grand, well done thing. Uh, Age of Fluctuation is, yeah, another powerhouse song as Tyler mentioned. And it is one of the best structured here, I think, taking a turn from delicate to violent on the turn of a dime. It is absolutely in exciting to listen to. And, and Youth Rebellion is an admittedly more straightforward kind of rock oriented song in comparison to the rest of this track list here, but it just goes so hard regardless of that. And again, it speaks to my earlier point about how everything here is so memorable and distinct in its own way that you can never really, really feel like the record is just repeating itself or doing the same thing over again. Uh, and extra story though, I would say is the weakest point on here being a bit more transitionary, but look, some of the best albums, I, this one included. I would like to come to the defense of it just because um, it, 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 having a transitionary track on your record, I don't think necessarily takes points off the album. No, I don't fits. think so either. And also I think that song is a gorgeous melody, even if it is short. And no, I, I wouldn't discredit that at all. But I've been seeing some some takes that it, it, it weakens the album and I just don't agree with I, that. I am just saying it is weaker in comparison to the rest of the album, but it, it in it of itself does not weaken the album. It is just the least good thing on here. Agreed. Uh, yeah. Don't gotta be at the bottom. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, and I mean, but right after that there's like chicken and i can feel my heart touching you to to bring this album to a close and with like this these clearer more satisfying guitar driven melodies which are also very impactful uh and, and the album is just satisfyingly warm uh, and bittersweet it, it encapsulates loneliness dullness nostalgia just the whole gambit of coming of age just so tightly packaged within this record in yeah a way that is i think very unprecedented i haven't seen done in a whole lot of other things uh i mean really the only direct reference point i would have for this is uh as mentioned earlier by jake actually a show like fully coolly being for me figured you're gonna make that comp yep. yeah just the most direct analog of the feeling of warm, lovely nostalgia in a way that uh, I, I can see myself returning to over and over again. This record has, has, is best played in my opinion, late at night or on overcast days because it just, it, it fills you with that, that, it, it fills that emptiness, that void. I think it's, it's just one of the most beautiful things released in a long time. And frankly, I, I might go so far as to say it's my favorite new release record since last year's Microphones record. Should we move on to yeah. favorite tracks and ratings? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. We can do that. Um, well, we might as well do, order. The, do the reverse order then since that's become the norm, alternating. <laughs> uh, yeah. So my three favorite tracks on this album are um, Beautiful World, White Ceiling, and Age of Fluctuation. I don't have a least favorite track, and the album gets 10 out of 10 from me. Nice. Um, so my favorite tracks are... Um, I'm going to say... And low sentimentalism. Uh, let's go with Beautiful World as well. And I'm going to say Extra Story. Just going to say that. Uh, in part, actually, just the lyrical conceit is beautiful of going through um, ages as representative of the stages of a person's life and commenting on where they're at at that stage. It just, I think it's beautiful. I also don't have these favorite tracks. It's getting a nine and a half from me. I love that for like most of this past week, my favorite track has been Analog Sentimentalism. And now it's not even in my top three. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I noticed that. Music be good. <laughs> Morgan. 
Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <sighs> my favorite tracks are "Beautiful World," "I Can Feel My Heart Touching You," and I'll say the title track, least favorite. Uh, uh, for you, um, yeah, fuck it. We'll do we'll do what we did for the Meadowlands and just give it a preemptive ten. <laughs> because I can see the trajectory of this and it's upwards yeah. and it's already, and it would have been like a nine and a half and it's, it's still upwards. So. Yeah. Um, um, three favorite tracks are analog sentimentalism, white ceiling and age of fluctuation uh yeah this is getting a nine and a half from me 9.5 that 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 does make me that does put a smile on my face (laughs) (laughs) the world is a beautiful place it makes it makes it makes me it makes me smile on my face i think that's that's got to be one of my highest new ratings very poor choice of words (laughs) <laughs> it's your second highest because I know there's a big gap between microphones and everything else. <laughs> I've never seen him laugh that hard. <laughs> Jake. <laughs> My three favorite tracks. Well, it looks like a beat right now. <laughs> Beautiful world, age of fluctuation. <laughs> I can feel my heart touching you. (laughs) Guess my least favorite extra story. I give it a nine. (laughs) Okay, you need to hear this, right? So this record is a 9.6 average. Oh, yeah. The the highest rated new release we've ever had. Mm. Let's go. Let's fucking go. By point one. And it's... And it's all August's fault. It's because like, <laughs> whatever it was before, he was he, like had it like had like a five, and the rest of us had it a ten. But the last one was Ohms by yes. Deftones. Oh yeah, yes. so I do be exaggerating <laughs> for the <laughs> point. This is but, good. I I so I, I love that hmm. we've we've improved by just point one because that means there's still room for for mm-hmm. a higher potential Absolutely. record someday. Just to give you some context. Other records at 9.6, of which there are four. Um, from from now on, whenever I do this, I'm just going to choose three for efficiency. But the four are Hand Cannot Erase, mm. Third, yes. Bone Machine, mm. and Blackwater Park. <laughs> yep. I love that wow. those are also Company. records. I love that those are also, correct me if I'm wrong, but also all records that all five of us have rated as well. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that makes that yeah. even more impressive. Holy Dead shit. wing, your throne is in trouble. <laughs> Literally a 10.0. <laughs> It'll be beaten by a 10.1. I'll just be like, I give the album a 10.5 and none of you can Let's, stop like, me. What, what do we do to separate order of that? Yeah, like August, alphabetical? August is going to be the first person to give an album a 10.5. <laughs> yes, exactly. Noted, money on it. Noted, uh, High Epitome rating of giver positivity. <laughs> yeah. um, well, uh, so let us let us know well. what you think at home of these two albums. Um, to see the next part of the dream and smiling with no teeth. If you haven't heard them, why the fuck are you still here? Um, and if you don't like them, them, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Get out. But if you of were mixed, house. if you were mixed in some Stop way, that- being a scrub. Clean out your ears and get it in you. If you were mixed in some way, I hope at least that what we've said maybe gives you a new perspective. But let us know what you think of the records. Um, And next week, we're going to be reviewing um, some more fire. Uh, We have a new album from The Antlers, Green to Gold, their first album in uh, seven years. We have a new record from Shoo Shoo, the collaborative album Oh No!, uh, we also will be touching on a new Death from Above 1979 record, Is for Lovers. So it's going to be another stacked week next week, and I can't wait to get to it. Um, 
before you disappear from our little corner of the internet as well, you should know that our record club this week is on uh, Orbital's Acid House, Acid Techno Classic uh, Insides, uh, which is, even if you haven't heard it, I think is going to be a really interesting record to talk about and hear about. Um, and so go and check that out as well. Um, yeah, anyone else got anything they want to say or plug? Thank God you let me crash on your couch. <laughs> Need find All right, it. rock over London, rock on Chicago, Coca-Cola, together tastes better. <laughs>